said. Hello, everyone. Some of you know me as Michael Lardner. I am part of the Marxist Education Project. Today, we begin a series of presentations of, that are based on the Pluto Wildcat series. You may not realize this, but just, I don't know, maybe uh, September of 2019, I could have the month wrong, Jake, uh, uh, Ali Muhammad Wilson was with us to talk about his prior book, Choke Points, with Manny Neff, which was one of the early books in the Wildcat series. The series has grown a lot, and this book is like an anchor book of the Wildcat series in that it explains much of what is has changed in our world and continues to change and why we as an anti-capitalist group of people, as we organize and broaden our anti-capitalist movement, we, we understand what we're up against. And one of those companies, when we can identify companies, that is one of our bigger challenges uh, to take on, as we have learned recently in Alabama, is Amazon. No one here needs me to go on about this. Jake and Ellen have both written a book on this and, and they're going to go into this quite a bit. I do want to let everyone know the next presentation in this series is going to be with Manny Ness and others. Uh, the title is Organizing Insurgency. That talk will take place on Saturday, the 22nd of May. Uh, this coming weekend, we have the last talk in our Creolizing Rosa Luxemburg series. This topic is unfinished conversations amongst revolutionary women, looking at Raya Donievskaya, uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, uh, Claudia Moore, and Sylvia Winter, and other important women in the, the African-American liberation movement and in the general liberation movement in, in Donievskaya's case. And that will be at two o'clock this Saturday. And then Sunday, the 16th, the Yale Globalization and Culture Group is coming to speak on a series called Resources, Relations, Who Decides Who Gets What of Our Resources, including our human resources. And that's the first in a series on resources relations that I encourage everyone to come to all our talks. This should be a very interesting one. If you can only pick one over the next month, that I would recommend that one, but there's much else going on. It's not too late to join our Grundrisse Reading Group on Saturdays, and there's much more you can see at our website, marksedproject.org. On that, I'm going to turn the Zoom floor over to Jake and Ellen. And welcome to both of you and welcome to all who are here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it, Michael. Um, it's, it's great to be back. Of course, we all uh, wish we were uh, in person. Um, you know, when, when I, I met with you all back in 2019, it was, it was just such a treat. And um, I really appreciate the converse, conversation. Um, excited to be here with Ellen. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd also like to thank um, all the all the wonderful staff at Pluto Press who have been so amazing and helpful um, for this book project, uh, the cost of free shipping, um, and the editors Manny Ness, uh, Robert Ovitz, and Peter Cole in particular. Uh, appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for for showing up today. Um, so Ellen and I, uh, you know, we we began this project uh, pre-pandemic. Okay, and. Uh, you know, starting in, in about March of 2020, both Ellen and I uh, had our children at home. Uh, we were finishing the book. Um, we added chapters on COVID. Um, it, it's been quite a ride, um, but it's so great to be here today to talk about all this. Um, uh, briefly, uh, I, I want to start with this picture. Um, you know, so there's a picture of the book, uh, but under it, there's a, there's a picture of a big brick building uh, and an Amazon sign. Um, this is my university. Uh, California State University, Long Beach. Um, we are known as the People's University uh, on the West Coast, um, one of the largest public systems in the United States, um, and the first to have a brick and mortar Amazon store on campus. My office 
is about the six window over those little skinny windows uh, where I wrote a bunch of this book. So it gave me a lot of motivation uh, to uh, really um, uh, work with Ellen on this book. Okay, so you know if 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 folks have been looking at the news, um, you know Ellen and I uh, decided let's let's go back over the past few weeks. So just to April, all these are headlines um, in in kind of mainstream corporate press about Amazon. Um, and so we have, uh, of course, Amazon's uh, concerted efforts and actions uh, to neutralize and destroy uh, the union movement. Okay, so uh, we, we know Amazon's a, a major union buster. Um, if we look at um, Jeff Bezos, uh, the world's richest uh, person um, who has uh, increased his uh, personal fortune uh, by over $40 billion uh, since the pandemic started. So while most regular people um, are struggling, um, you know, of course, the, the elite capitalists are uh, making record profits. Um, there's also been a lot of uh, talk in the press about the degradation of work. And that's something we're gonna talk about today um, because of Amazon's scale and size. It's so big, it's so massive. And Ellen's gonna touch on some of this. Um, it's really important to monitor how a big entity like Amazon is driving down working conditions and attacking unions. And of course, uh, we have to talk about racial justice when it comes to Amazon, that the majority of workers who uh, do all the hard work are workers of color, immigrant workers, Black and Latinx workers, and uh, a growing number of women of color workers are disproportionately working in the warehouses. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Ellen. and. Um, Ellen can provide some uh, context of some of the things that we argue uh, in the first chapter. Great, thanks. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's wonderful to be here with all of you and looking forward to the discussion afterwards. And certainly Amazon capitalism presents uh, a lot of challenges for labor. Uh, Amazon became the world's most valuable corporation in 2019, even prior to the pandemic. Uh, while its former CEO, Jeff Bezos, has amassed the largest personal fortunes in history at $191 billion, right? And um, if we think about uh, Amazon and its market capitalization, um, even prior to the pandemic, it was slightly more than the combined GDP of nine Latin American countries combined, right? That's huge, right? And so, you know, many scholars talk about, you know, Italian capitalism or Venezuelan capitalism. And, you know, given the sheer size of Amazon and its distinct sort of model and, and style of capital accumulation, you know, we, we suggest we need to consider Amazon capitalism, right? And uh, we argue that Amazon's rise marks a significant shift in the global economy uh, that we are labeling Amazon capitalism. And this is not to deny that Amazon is operating within global capitalism, larger, right, global capitalism. It's, it's operating within that larger system. But yet we argue it has a distinct model of capitalism that or other corporations mimic and it's helped to propel various novel features of our current capitalist economy. By 2019, Amazon owned half of the world's public cloud infrastructure, right? It's massive and that's sort of its profit center. Um, and AWS even powers the Zoom call, right? It's so influential, right? It's hard to get around it these days. Um, Amazon's global workforce, meanwhile, is growing. Um, it's currently at 1.3 million workers, and that is just the actual employees of the Amazon Corporation. Um, there are many other workers that work for Amazon sort of indirectly. Um, and so if we also consider the 500,000 uh, Amazon delivery drivers, right, these are not even counted in that 1.3 million figure, right? So it's the workforce is even more massive. Um, many of these delivery drivers, and Jake's going to talk more about this, are, are subcontracted, right? Working for small companies um, rather than for Amazon it, itself. And yet they're working for this corporation, right? So, so it has a huge impact and employs many, many, many workers. 
So what challenges does Amazon capitalism present for labor? Um, well, its rise in many ways reflects but also makes more visible, sort of like the visible part of the, the iceberg, right, that we see and is in the public eye, of many larger trends that are increasing in, in influence in our global capitalist society, including the increasing influence of finance capitalism that allows this rise of Amazon to take place, right, neoliberal politics and corporate power right, that's becoming so enormous, so concentrated in our current economy. And these present challenges for democracy and make it more difficult for workers and working class communities to influence politics, right? We can just consider for a moment the bidding war that took place a few years ago over which city would be the headquarters for Amazon second headquarters, right? And, and cities were competing with each other offering more and more financial incentives, tax giveaways, you know, free this or that, um, you know, subsidized highways and freeways and, you know, all sorts of infrastructure developments and all very costly things, right? <laughs> that, that cities were just competing with each other, you know, how much they could bend over backwards to bring uh, Amazon to their city, right? Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's huge and it makes it challenging, right, for working class communities uh, to fight back, but that doesn't necessarily mean they don't fight back. And in, in fact, right, in New York City, right, they were able to sort of turn Amazon away, right, with, with enormous resistance, right? Um, and maybe some of, some of you were maybe part of that. Right? Uh, and then on the other side of the coast, you know, the headquarters of Amazon's first headquarters, right, in Seattle, right, uh, we see that, that, you know, Amazon has huge impacts on local politics and initially defeated a progressive tax measure, right, uh, uh, that would have taxed that corporation, right, for a more affordable housing and, and, and so forth. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean that workers and working class communities can't fight back. And in fact, in Seattle, they did that. They were able to to, to pass an even better <laughs> tax initiative, you know, that was done through, through grassroots uh, democracy, a, a ballot initiative, no less, right? But nevertheless, I think those, you know, stories, you know, just make us aware of the challenge, right, that we face with this growing, massive corporation, right? And Amazon helps to promote certain novel forms of capitalism, right? When we're talking about Amazon capitalism, right, we need to consider, right, the, the impacts of electronic technology, right, that's presenting many new challenges for workers, but also for activists, even labor activists, environmental activists are getting tracked, right? Immigrants are getting tracked, right, uh, through this new electronic technology that Amazon has been promoting and investing in. Uh, and then for its workforce, right, they face algorithmic management, right? They're, they're under heavy electronic monitoring of their every move, right, and how much time they spend off tasks, how, how much they're making rate or, you know, making those uh, really unreasonable productivity standards or not, right? And then there's a surveillance of workers too in terms of their organizing as well, right? That, that creates a lot of challenges for organizing on the shop floor. Amazon has also helped to promote one-click instant consumerism. And probably many of us have engaged in this kind of consumer activity, right? That's so easy at the, you know, flick of a fingertip at our computers or iPhones, et cetera, right? And it really, we've seen this massive speed up of consumerism, right? And just this expectation that we're gonna get free shipping overnight, right? It's gonna happen quickly and, and so on. And that's a huge title shift in the global economy um, that's largely been driven by finance capitalism, right? So Amazon often isn't making um, profits in the short run. It, it's sort of thinking in over the long haul about its market uh, dominance, right? And over the long haul. Uh, but monthly, about 200 million unique visitors 
users visit Amazon.com to purchase consumer products. Um, many of these products are, are sold by Amazon, but there's about 2 million third-party sellers, and it's probably growing even more, that are contributing to this corporation's 440 million metric ton carbon footprint. All of those deliveries going out very quickly, usually with a very small uh, product, you know, in an envelope or a box or so forth, right? All of those mini deliveries going out to neighborhoods uh, and the freight, you know, being trafficked in, you know, uh, by ship, by truck, by tr railways, right? Also airports, freight coming in and, and the expansion of airports into warehouse communities such as the one um, where my university is located, which is an inland empire, Riverside and San Bernardino counties, right? And my picture here is sort of background of that sort of inland port, right? And all the the many uh, deliveries, you know, coming in and out of the warehouses and into people's neighborhoods. It has a massive environmental footprint, right? This carbon footprint um, that dirties our air, right? And it's also taking a huge toll on our public health as well. In the Inland Empire, the asthma rate is very, very high, particularly among children. Right. So the rise of Amazon's e-commerce business has contributed to the decline in brick and mortar shops, right? More and more of us are, are consuming online. It's so convenient. And, you know, especially with the pandemic, you know, many of us have been concerned about, you know, the health risks of going out and going shopping, right? And so um, many more people are, are uh, relying on home delivered goods these days. And so those brick and mortar shops are, are closing down, right? Uh, and some of these are including the unionized grocery stores, right? Which is, you know, did a big attack on organized labor. I think another major impact that Amazon is having uh, is a sort of rise in surveillance capitalism, right? That uh, Shoshona Zuboff uh, has described very well in her uh, book, I don't know if any of you have read it, right? But she talks about the, the rise of surveillance capitalism that refers to a new economic order that claims human experience as free raw material for hidden commercial practices of extraction, prediction, and sales. And so with every sort of click that we make on that one click instant consumerism, you know, Amazon is tracking it, all that information, right? What products we're buying for how much, uh, how much they can, you know, uh, they can make their, their products worth, you know, or ask us to pay for, you know, and they're, they're trying to beat out the, the competition, right? And using all of that massive uh, consumer data, right, that they're tracking us. They also are tracking their workforce as well, right? Particularly the blue collar workforce and warehousing and delivery. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, they're, they're often tracking their every moves, you know, in terms of uh, uh, scanning their scan rate, you know, for uh, scanning products and so forth, right? Making sure that their workers are working quickly on time. Uh, so that all those deliveries go out on time in that expedited fashion. And then there's also the, the Ring Home Surveillance Systems and Alexa, right? That's also kind of monitoring us and what we're talking about, you know, what we're thinking about and so forth, right? One of the chapters that I worked on in this edited volume um, focused on race, gender, and warehouse labor in Amazon. Um, and there is certainly a racial dimension to this, right? And, and certainly Amazon uh, sort of represents, you know, uh, racial capitalism, right, at its worst, right? So Black, Latinx, and immigrant workers are disproportionately working for Amazon in, as blue-collar warehouse workers. Uh, and they've been very much impacted by Amazon's surveillance-driven low-wage jobs, right? Um, you know, these entry-level jobs uh, in the warehouses, they usually typically make 15 bucks an hour, right, which is not enough to live on, you know, particularly if you have a family to feed, uh, if you're a single mother and so on, right, so these are, are 
poverty jobs, right? Uh, and often many of these workers are, are hired on as seasonal workers, right? So they don't have employment security. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of turnover. They're under heavy pressure to make rate and the, the, the productivity standards are very, very high, right? Uh, very unreasonable. And so there's a lot of pressure for them to, to work quickly, uh, work fast, right? Or if they don't, right, they'll, they'll get a lot of warnings, you know, uh, and, uh, and then they could face termination, getting fired, right? And turnover is quite high, you know, both because there's a lot of firing going on, but also because workers are quitting. It's just really physically grueling work. And a lot of, for many of these workers are working full time and the shifts are 10 hours usually at the minimum, right? And if they work overtime, it could be working 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Um, and the, the work is very physically grueling uh, work, a lot of lifting, a lot of walking often, or some of the workers are working at one station, just standing there for hours, right? Wishing they could move and walk, right? So I think it's both sort of torture on the body to like stand still for that long, but then also the other workers that are walking around very, very quickly at a fast pace. And there's a lot of accidents, right? Uh, in, in this workplace as well. It's very accident prone. The warehouse industry is one of the more dangerous industries generally, but Amazon in particular, that accident rate is even higher than the industry average, right? Um, and uh, so with this chapter uh, that I did and another one sort of looking at the surveillance driven uh, warehouse was based on interviews um, that a team of student researchers uh, collected uh, of former and current warehouse workers, right? So I worked, I trained students at my university because as I mentioned I'm in the Inland Empire where there's a lot of warehouses so a lot of those workers are young student workers or sometimes their family members their brother their sister um, sometimes their parents work in the warehouses right um, so they were able to reach out to their friends and, and co-workers former co-workers um, do these interviews um, and most of them right um, more than 80% of them had some sort of concern about making rate, right? Really, they feel a lot of pressure, you know, to make rate. They worry if they don't, you know, that they're going to lose their job and so, so on. Um, women of color are the fastest growing part of Amazon's low wage workforce in warehousing and delivery. And traditionally, warehouse work has been mostly men, right? Uh, so women are entering into a male dominated workplace, you know, and, and like other male dominated workplaces, they often face a lot of gender and sexual harassment. Um, and that's particularly true of the women that sometimes get the opportunity to drive forklifts, because that's usually been the, the sort of male domain, you know, and so when women uh, get to learn how to drive a forklift and are working, right, they often uh, face a lot of gender harassment where they're sort of teased for being bad drivers and, and so on. Um, and then there was just really awful uh, stories too that these um, warehouse workers shared about, you know, being sexually harassed in the warehouses. And you have to remember that often they're working in these enormous warehouses going through these aisles that are relatively isolated, right? So often there's not somebody observing what's happening, which allows sexual harassment to take place. You know, and then when they report it to the HR, they were often given the runaround. They were, HR would say, well, did anybody observe it? You know, and then they wouldn't believe them or they just, you know, they didn't really uh, address it um, uh, adequately, um, which sometimes led some women to quit, you know, because they just didn't want to face that. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, so I think there's enormous uh, racial and gender dynamics. Um, and so women, yeah, women of color are facing not just only gender and sexual harassment, but also racism as well, sometimes xenophobia uh, as well, sort of anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim sentiments, right? So uh, all of that are, are, are things for organizers to keep in mind, you know, um, as they're organizing this workforce that, you know, that, you know, 
you know, there's some challenges, right, to, to creating solidarity for workers. And, you know, there needs to be some, some anti-racist, anti-sexist sort of education, right, um, uh, as part of the political education. But, but many of these workers are, you know, facing just ruling long hours um, and, and are also quite ripe and open to, to organizing as well. Thanks, Ellen. Um, you know, so one of the things that uh, we really wanted to focus on is um, how Amazon has, uh, because of its scale and size, and again, I think, it, you know, I, I had intended to mention at the beginning uh, before Ellen started, but we're not saying that Amazon is like a, you know, from some liberal critique, a bad apple, right, or some bad actor amongst other good corporations, right? That's not what we're saying. Um, you know, all corporations share the same fundamental, uh, you know, uh, motivation, and that's the pursuit of profit. It's it's all based within exploitation. Um, that being said, what we really are focusing in on is Am Amazon's uh, impact, uh, not only on the U.S. economy but on the global economy, and its its rapid expansion is an important case study to not only, um, you know, uh, you know, critique capitalism, uh, but, you know, it, Amazon is, is an important site to bring together uh, a lot of different social justice movements. Um, but our focus on logistics is really important. Um, the movement of goods. So behind me uh, is the Port of Los Angeles. So I live a few miles away from the, the Port of Long Beach, uh, the twin port of Port of LA and Long Beach, 40% of all goods entering the US go through these twin ports. So most of the goods that we purchase on Amazon comes through uh, a port. Um, and, you know, my previous project um, was, was really looking at the rise of like retail power uh, in global capitalism and spent a lot of time uh, learning um, from Professor Edna Bonisich, uh, Marxist uh, sociologist who, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, excuse me, Walmart and Walmart, you know, the world's uh, biggest private corporation, world's largest and private employer. Um, and much of what I learned about uh, Walmart's rise in power and, you know, uh, their mastery of logistics uh, in many ways was upended by Amazon. Um, and, and so Walmart's been scrambling to um, keep up, if you will, uh, and has changed a lot of practices in, in how they do business. Um, but I think, you know, looking at Amazon and how it's been building the world's largest logistics infrastructure in the world. Um, this has been something that, uh, you know, the book highlights Kim Moody's chapter, uh, it's an excellent chapter, uh, focuses in on um, why logistics, understanding logistics is a, is a crucial uh, aspect to understanding capitalism. Um, and, you know, just, you know, an, a personal anecdote. So I have an uh, eight, I have two children, a uh, 10 year old and an eight year old. Uh, my, my son, Shay, um, you know, is eight and a half years old. And uh, when he was born, right? Uh, you know, eight and a half years ago, little baby, uh, I had to go out and get diapers for, for my baby. Um, and at that time, most middle class parents were driving to like Target or some big box retailer and purchasing diapers and driving back home. Um, but just in the short, you know, time span uh, of my son's life, eight and a half years. Uh, now, Amazon is the world's largest seller of diapers, right? So diapers are now delivered to middle class neighborhoods around uh, the world. And I think it, uh, this time period is where we're seeing, um, you know, uh, an, an immense expansion in the way we consume goods. So the supply chain, uh, when my son was born, ended at the brick and mortar shop, right? The logistics supply chain. Um, but now, of course, it's our it's our homes, it's our apartments, it's it's our local um, locker. It's the one on my campus where my students are going. Um, and you know what's also interesting about kind of what Amazon has done differently than, like, say, Walmart is that Amazon handled its own warehousing. Uh, warehousing was something that Walmart largely contracted out. Um, Amazon handles its own warehousing, uh, distribution, and fulfillment services, um, less relying on third-party uh, providers. Um, and in fact, you know, today, if, if you're an Amazon Prime member and you order a package and it gets to your apartment, your, your wherever you live in two days, um, the chances are that it's 
that package is delivered by a subcontracted uh, third party logistics worker um, who drives a van uh, that says Amazon on it, that wears a uniform that says Amazon on it, but they don't work for Amazon, right? They work for these small trucking companies of no more than about 40 vans. And um, these workers um, are called delivery service providers and DSPs is the way that Amazon has expanded its market share um, into, uh, you know, delivery. Uh, it's challenged, you know, the, the United States Postal Service Union. Um, it's UPS has been uh, very much thrown uh, upside down uh, because of this. Um, and so they're driving down wages in the sector. And of course, there's a whole, uh, there's a number of uh, gig drivers, Amazon Flex drivers that use their own vehicles to deliver goods for Amazon as well, or grocery delivery. Um, and so this impact on working class people has been uh, tremendous. So one of the chapters uh, that I wrote um, in the cost of free shipping focused solely on logistics. And um, I, I, I describe this kind of sea change in logistics as the Amazonification of logistics. Um, and that, you know, this extension of the supply chain uh, away from the brick and mortar shops to a person's home created this uh, increase in importance on what we call last mile logistics, right? The last mile delivery, right? Um, it's the most expensive part of the supply chain. Um, it's very labor intensive. And that's where Amazon has invested heavily um, into dominating the last mile. And in fact, that's the reason why Amazon um, acquired Whole Foods. Whole Foods, um, by purchasing Whole Foods, um, Amazon became the fifth largest grocery store in the United States. But the main motivation uh, was, you know, the Whole Foods kind of last mile um, strategic location that Whole Foods tend to be in affluent areas. And so it gave Amazon a competitive advantage over let's say target uh, that were already dominating kind of the upper middle class consumer uh, market. Um, so there's been this expansion of the last mile sector, especially in, in, ur in dense urban areas. So um, I live in Long Beach, California. Ellen lives in Los Angeles and works in Riverside. Um, many of you live in New York City. Um, this is where uh, we see the, the greatest concentration of Amazon's infrastructure in terms of the last mile sector. Um, but it tends to be that the massive warehouses tend to be on the outskirts of urban areas. So whether that's the Inland Empire or just outside uh, the urban setting in the East Coast. Um, and these tend to be um, reliant and, and, and uh, overrepresent uh, working class communities of color uh, who are working these jobs, as Ellen mentioned. One of the other things that you know, e-commerce broadly, but Amazon driving in particular has been, it's been the speed up in the circulation of consumer goods. Uh, so we call this a global worker speed up. And that's, um, you know, really been uh, driven by these technologies of worker surveillance and control that Ellen uh, touched on, um, that workers are, are expected to work faster under constant surveillance um, and with very little institutional protections, right? Um, can't join a union in Amazon, largely a massive union busting company. Um, so this integration of automation is another thing that Amazon is driving in its warehouses. Um, this is a picture of um, one of those Amazon vans, and this is the, the rear view mirror. Um, this is the, an AI camera, um, Amazon recently rolled out uh, these AI artificial intelligence cameras into a number of these delivery vans um, where, uh, you know, workers are being monitored at all times. And, you know, um, so many of the workers are frustrated about this uh, and they're already surveilled. Um, uh, the, the workers are surveilled um, uh, every movement already. They, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, some of my research on uh, these last mile delivery drivers in Los Angeles. Um, so one of the things that, um, you know, uh, even Ellen's chapter looked at was, you know, the introduction of uh, technology and robotics in warehouses and, and how this has posed a new challenge to uh, unionization efforts. Um, Amazon's um, investment into, um, you know, this type of technology, I think is striking. So when Shoshana Zuboff wrote um, 
you know, uh, surveillance capitalism, it pretty much focused on like Google and Apple, right? Google is basically credited for kind of starting the surveillance capitalism. But it's important to remember that Amazon's a tech company, right? And unlike Google, um, Amazon relies upon uh, hundreds of thousands of blue collar workers and has this vast physical infrastructure, right? Um, that uh, they're basically blending in uh, kind of tech uh, surveillance driven um, uh, capital accumulation processes with a very physical infrastructure. And that's what makes Amazon uh, an important site to study and to understand if we're going to build resistance to capitalism. So uh, someone mentioned in the chat, uh, Chris Smalls. Um, you know, we, we interviewed Chris uh, last year during the pandemic. And actually, Ellen and I just, just wrote a paper on how workers of color, uh, in particular, Black and Latinx workers and immigrant workers, um, have uh, bore uh, the brunt of much of the repression uh, and, and kind of a retaliation uh, by Amazon, but also leading the resistance uh, in many cases across uh, warehousing in the US. Um, today's massive logistics infrastructure are located at the outskirts of these major urban areas, right? Large concentrations of low paid workers, workers of color, immigrant workers. And, but this is global. You know, we see whether it's in Rome, you see um, in, uh, in Rome, Italy, many of the last mile delivery drivers uh, are migrant workers, right? In Germany, uh, many are migrant workers. In Poland, uh, are being Polish workers are being pitted against German workers who are union, right? So this is a global process here that is a massive, massive implications for unions around the world, not just in the U.S. Uh, so there's been a fierce attack on unions, and so for many of you who followed uh, the Bessemer, Alabama case, uh, you are familiar with. Uh, you know, new new report just came out today that Amazon was effectively giving out, um, you know, break coupons for workers who uh, seem to uh, vote uh, anti-union, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of trickery going on and the, the deck is stacked. Amazon is, you know, has an unparalleled budget, right? Um, so there's been this deeper integration of automation and technology all leading to uh, one, a degradation of work. Um, and so, you know, what I focused on a lot in this book was the last mile delivery drivers, um, the workers who uh, do that last leg of delivery, come to your apartment and your, your, uh, your house and deliver your, your doorstep. Um, many reports of workers urinating in bottles, whether that's in the warehouses or in the delivery vans. Um, and so, um, you know, many of the drivers, um, we're posting pictures recently when Amazon uh, put up this uh, ridiculous tweet about uh, you don't really believe this whole peeing in bottles thing and all these drivers, you know, sent these pictures like you mean this, right? Um, so in conclusion, I'm, I'm going to turn it back over to Ellen, but um, one of the things that we'd like to talk to you all today about and definitely want to hear your perspective on these things is how do we resist, right? How do we um, come together and, and kind of build coalitions to resist not just Amazon, but what Amazon represents? Thanks, Jake. Uh, so yeah, so just as Amazon is rising, resistance to Amazon is also rising and, and happening globally as this is a transnational corporation. Um, Amazon provides a strategic new target, we argue, that has been inspiring activists to further collaborate across cities, across nations, as well as movements. Uh, and in the Inland Empire, uh, where my university is located, uh, we see this in terms of environmental justice uh, resistance to Amazon and the uh, forging of blue-green alliances around the expansion of Amazon and particularly the Eastgate Airport, uh, which was expanding uh, to allow more freight coming in and out uh, for Amazon warehouses, which are highly concentrated in, in this region. And so environmental justice activists are working alongside labor activists to push back and, and, and fighting and demanding, you know, both good jobs in clean air, right, and, and 
pushing on resistance around warehouse development more generally. Uh, we also see uh, struggles to organize uh, warehouse workers, but also the delivery drivers, which is perhaps most developed in Italy, where there, there was a successful campaign to unionize uh, delivery drivers. Um, and then in the United States, we see uh, efforts to organize warehouse workers happening from coast to coast, right? Probably the, the most recent, most publicized was, right, the Bamazon campaign to organize uh, warehouse workers in Bessemer, Alabama, right? Uh, which unfortunately did not succeed, um, uh, but it really caught the public imagination, right? And, and a lot of solidarity happening um, from coast to coast around that campaign. Um, and, you know, very uh, sort of vibrant, uh, you know, collective action taking place in, in Bessemer, you know, and despite, you know, a huge harassment campaign and, and labor law violations and, and so forth, right, hundreds of workers did vote for the union, even despite all of that anti-union uh, action that was happening. Uh, you know, and this is not isolated, right? There was efforts to organize and try to unionize warehouse workers in New Jersey um, and other parts of the United States. And I think that's going to continue to pop up, right, uh, around the nation. Um, it has been happening both, you know, through union campaigns, but beyond them as well, right? The rise of Amazonians United, I think, is, is really... They have sort of their own uh, alliance and, and they've been building alliances uh, with uh, labor activists, not just in the United States, but in Europe and other parts of the world as well, right? So there's growing transnational and national links um, in this anti-Amazon uh, resistance movement. Um, and we've seen this, you know, uh, over the years in, in terms of Prime Day protests, right? Protests on the Prime Day, the big consumer uh, day that Amazon's created, you know, also Black Friday, right? We uh, often there's strikes and protests happening uh, across nations uh, that's coordinated, right? Um, and Amazon, you know, it remains a, a key site, you know, for building global alliances among, among labor activists, right? Uh, but also across social movements, right? Because Amazon's impact, right? It, it, it goes beyond just the workplace, right? Uh, you know, it, it also is promoting surveillance technology that's used in our communities, right, to surveil immigrants, the police use it, right? They've been getting contracts with uh, also, you know, the, the, that, you know, the federal government as well, right, to surveil, you know, various people, right, <laughs> and control them and so on. And, you know, so there's a racial justice, social justice uh, movement, you know, uh, that's, you know, uh, you know, beginning to speak out at, about this and challenge it, right? You might have heard about the high-tech employees, um, and this is one of the chapters in the, the edited volume, sort of focuses on the organizing among high-tech employees and who are saying, you know, I don't want to be complicit with ICE surveillance and so forth. No tech for ICE, right? Uh, you know, and there's all sorts of other sort of civil liberty uh, violations and surveillance of activists that, that Amazon has been complicit in. There's also concerns about, you know, this growing monopoly, right, and uh, how it's maybe violating various anti-monopoly laws, right? So there's sort of a whole legal strategy of resisting it that's not just taking place in the United States, but also in other parts of the world, such as India as well, right? Uh, and, and there, um, one of the chapters in our edited volumes focuses on India and uh, small business people, right? We're rising up and, and calling Amazon, you know, this is economic imperialism, right? And, and so on, right? So, and then there's a lot of sort of pro-democracy uh, activists as well, very concerned with this large growing uh, company and its impacts on, on local level politics as well, right? And, and the difficulties of, of working class communities, right? Uh, having a political voice um, in their own cities and so forth. So, so there's growing um, efforts to sort of unite different activists, right, and, and different uh, coalitions and alliances building and very interested in hearing, yeah, your own thoughts around this and 
Yeah, and I think that's it. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. So if with questions and comments, please write the word stack in chat if you know to do that. Otherwise, you have to show yourself and raise your hand and be subject to when I see your hand being raised. So um, there are lots of people in the chat already who are asking many things, but I'm not going to go through that chat and figure out what question is first. I'm, um, I'm just looking for someone to, um, uh, it will be Michael Dola. Michael. We can't see you or hear you, Michael. Hi, hello. I um I I came in on this uh late, so I'm hope I hope this is uh I see it's being recorded. I'd love to send this around to people who aren't on the call. Um and I kind of, I wanted to go after someone else to kind of get my thoughts together, but um, whatever. I, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, people who, who spoke and um, I'm calling from uh, Brooklyn. And, um, and yeah, I just went on Christian Small's uh, uh, Twitter account and it looks like uh, Amazon texted employees that uh, I guess were, are at that warehouse and said that people wearing the Amazon vest, uh, because he is kind of like staked out there with a bunch of people um, trying to get a union, uh, uh, an organization drive happening in Staten Island. Um, Amazon made it clear that they did not represent Amazon employees. So I thought that was pretty funny. He's, he's definitely getting, he continues to get in the craw of management over there. Um, and I remember going there a few weeks ago I'd never been there before, took the bus over from the ferry, and um, it's, it's kind of like visiting the Death Star, except if the Death Star was on a wetland in Staten Island. So I'm also very interested in this blue-green um, organizing that's happening on the West Coast because, um, yeah, I, uh, we, we're, we were trying to save a, a, um, a wetland across the street. For, well, not across the street, but, but not too far away from the Amazon warehouse. Um, so that it wouldn't become a BJ's wholesale. People might be familiar with that um, kind of local fight, um, which seems to be legally, you know, um, whatever, whatever, I'm not gonna mumble on too long, much longer, but Amazon is on that Northwest side of Staten Island and they are on like spongy ground. They, they fill that in and the next Sandy that comes the reason why that the neighborhoods on that side of the island didn't get hammered as badly as Mid Island and the South Shore was because of those natural barriers. They're like sponges. So very, very interested in 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 what kind of like work that can be done. Um, you know, Turtles and Teamsters, um, 2021, and um, and and yeah, and and you know, it's it's kind of a a, a tricky thing. The last thing I'll say, like as a Marxist, like. And, and an environmentalist, like it's clear that like Amazon, those kinds of businesses are unsustainable. At the same time, the workers need to organize. Like, and if you're organized and you're able to like um, struggle together and, and not be atomized, you can like, you know, put an end to that harassment, which is, in, is, is very um, upsetting. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. There's, I want to just read out Victor's uh, question on stack. He said, and, uh, Ellen and Jake, uh, two or three at a time. So Michael's comments and then Victor is asking for an elaboration on the role of finance capital in the expansion of Amazon, which that could be a several volumes, I would think, but uh, if you could do a short answer on that as well. So we'll take those two and then we'll, there's already three other uh, hefty questions right after that. Well, I think on the finance capitalism, my, my understanding is, um, you know, for Amazon to provide this really cheap delivered goods at a fast pace, right, it wasn't a, a 
profit making thing in the short run right and so it it had to to rely on investors to sort of back it right um and as it's sort of going for the long haul trying to get the market capitalization and then as as jake is pointing out it's sort of also taking over the logistics sector as well right um and uh and then putting pressure on these small um companies that use the, the consumer platform to use its logistics company as well, right? And, and so the, the, the investment, yeah, my understanding is that, um, you know, had there not been sort of financial capitalism sort of backing it, right, it would have been more difficult to, to afford to take the sort of short run hits to the profit, right, uh, to sort of grow this entire system. And I think in terms of the questions about the Blue Green Alliance, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's taken different forms uh, over the years. I think initially there has been um, for uh, a coalition uh, that was fighting for a community benefits agreement around, you know, the expansion of the airport um, at Eastgate, which was being expanded for Amazon. And so the community was sort of pushing back against it, sort of, asking for more protections for the the local community you know saying hey maybe there needs to be some regulation on what hours these planes are going overhead you know the noise pollution the air pollution uh you know and also maybe there needs to be filters or air filters in the surrounding neighborhoods you know to uh deal with all the air pollution uh, and so forth. And then, you know, for the workers, right, they're, they're arguing for, you know, better jobs, you know, uh, for unionized, you know, good paying jobs with benefits rather than, you know, all, a lot of temp jobs, you know, at low wages, no benefits, right? So there was sort of an alliance around that. And, you know, unfortunately, it didn't work. There were some environmental lawsuits, you know, and I think those are maybe still being played out in the court. Um, uh, you know, th that was also sort of arguing that, you know, there wasn't enough analysis done of the, the environmental impacts, you know, um, so kind of using some of the legal uh, strategy there. But then lately, um, there's been a, a push for a moratorium on warehouse developments, because as I mentioned, the warehousing is so concentrated in this region, and it really has really heavy air pollution, you know, there's a high asthma rates, you know, a lot of people are really affected and, you know, and then, you know, that asthma that you have, it makes you more prone to other kinds of illnesses, including COVID, right? So um, there, there has been sort of a push that, you know, we just have had enough <laughs> warehousing in this area, right? And so uh, there's uh, been a push to try to get a moratorium on warehousing in San Bernardino. And um, there is, some local politicians that have been, you know, supporting that effort. Um, so, you know, so it has taken, you know, slightly different forms, although a lot of the, the people kind of working together um, are the same players over the years. I, I wonder if I could, um, I, I really appreciate the, the you know, the, the question also on, on the blue green, um, you know, part of this. I wonder if I could just share just a visual really quick. Um, this is a, I'm going to share this real quick. Um, can you all see this map? Um, this is the high school uh, where my, nie my niece attends um, in Fontana. Um, and it's Kaiser High School, which was the old Kaiser Steel plant in the Inland Empire in Fontana, California. Um, and it's right in the heart of the industrial park. And this entire region here, um, you know, these were the, this is where my brother, this is where my niece goes, the other niece, middle school. These, these schools are surrounded by logistics facilities. And if you zoom in and start looking, you see all these um, warehouses, including Amazon. Um, and this is uh, just one example of one neighborhood in one city in this massive region that has been completely upended by industrial pollution driven by logistics. Um, and so it's certainly you know, very personal for, for me and Ellen. Ellen's students are uh, from this region and work in these jobs. And you know, I have family in this region. Um, and it's an important part of uh, also the labor 
uh, critical labor discussions and that we need to have more connections with uh, kind of environmental justice, workers justice and anti-capitalist kind of conversations. Uh, so I really appreciate you bringing that up. So we have Dave S and um, Carlos Cabral. David S, uh, you're up next with your question. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. And thanks to the speakers. It's been very interesting. Uh, I'm a postal worker in Michigan and I put in the chat, <clears throat> I'm all for organizing Amazon, uh, trying to unionize them, unionize the contractors. I'm wondering in addition about um, studies or efforts to boycott them. I feel like, and that's what I put in the chat, that it's this growing monster. And I, I know progressives, activists, even people call themselves radical that still shop on Amazon. Some people feel like, well, they have no choice. Um, I feel like there are choices, although they're getting more and more limited. But I feel like if we don't stop it, it's just this growing monster that we are helping to feed that is attacking uh, workers' rights and workers' power. Yeah, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, many people would agree with you on that. And I think, you know, of course, as you know, um, you know, when boycotts are called for by workers um, and when community allies can support workers uh, demand for boycotts, they can be very effective. Of course, Amazon is such a beast. Um, it would have to be a massive effort, right? Um, you know, when we're, you know, thinking about like where I'm from in Southern California and, and, you know this probably way better than me, but the last year, um, just in the my region, this kind of greater Los Angeles region, Amazon delivered over a billion packages, just in LA alone, 1.2 billion packages, um, and tripled their last mile of delivery um, infrastructure in the past 11 months, just in Southern California. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's an enormously uh, massive task, but one that I think, uh, if coordinated effectively, where workers uh, are at the table in in kind of calling the shots on that, could be very effective. But there would have to be a new kind of kind of community consumer worker alliance that we haven't seen uh, at this level. Um, but you know, we are seeing an interesting kind of global connection. Um, and Ellen had mentioned. Um, you know, the work, uh, kind of the class struggle kind of approach that Amazonians United has taken of uh, really kind of bottom them up grassroots style, worker democracy style um, in many of these warehouses now. Um, but they are globally connected to Amazon Workers International um, and we're part of this Make Amazon Pay um, uh, call that came out uh, last year around Cyber Monday and Black Friday. Um, and so oftentimes these kind of capitalist consumption fake holidays like Amazon Day, you know, these pseudo holidays um, are, are, are where we've seen kind of regional boycott calls. But to date, there hasn't been something massive yet, but maybe that's what's uh, next, Dave. Dave, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Yeah. Um, what, what have, um, just in, in your experience as, you know, uh, a postal worker, what, what has been kind of your, um, and I know another postal worker who I see quite often, and I, I, I got, uh, this person's opinion. Um, but what's been your experience just kind of the last couple of years, um, uh, you know, as a postal worker and uh, how has Amazon impacted your job? Um, it, it really adds to the misery. Um, I, I'm four years in and uh, especially the um, first two, two and a half years, um, we had just tons of packages on what's called Amazon Sundays. As a postal worker and carrier, I'm mandated uh, to be there and do that. Um, and uh, it um, has just added to the volume. Now it's a it's a double edge because uh, post office wants the work, um, and we want to have volume. But at the same time, uh, the the Sundays and the extra. And now I think it's coming to it's come to UPS. It's it's impacting the whole industry in terms of our our schedule and feels like Amazon is <clears throat> dictating. Now, Amazon in our area, I'm in West Michigan, is doing more of its own delivery, um, even on Sundays. There's still some Sunday delivery by the post office for stuff that they can't do. 
Um, but uh, the biggest impact has been just the amount of hours and packages and during the pandemic, um, you know, they just can't handle, even with them growing, they can't handle the volume. And so that ends up uh, impacting postal workers. And I'm a rural carrier, so we're on an evaluated system. So the uh, packages, unless there's a count, a lot of times people are delivering for free, basically, because they're on a time study and if the time study hasn't been done, then they don't, uh, they don't get paid for it. But yeah, I appreciate your comments. And I think as far as boycott, even if it started out more symbolic, at least it's, it sets up a, a dialogue and discussion. I mean, obviously the more effective organizing is and a boycott, the better and the more you know unions and community people can get on board. Um, but I think if it reached, even where people know, okay, well, it's so massive, we're, it may be a small dent, at least it it puts that out in a publicity um, education type of way. It will, you know, why boycott Amazon? Why bo boycott Whole Foods? Sure, really appreciate it. Uh, made me think. You know, I have a, I had a couple students that uh, found temporary work as Sunday subcontracted um, postal workers that didn't work for UPS but drove UPS jeeps or you know delivery vehicles. De solely delivering Amazon packages. Hmm. This is like in like Rancho Cucamonga, California and Pasadena. Uh, just a bizarre kind of layer of, of sub-employment uh, to meet that demand that you mentioned. Um, and they were there paid like 14 bucks and 15 bucks an hour. And, uh, but they were saying they were driving government vehicles. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, even that it's called Amazon Sundays at the post office feels like this power dynamic that the most important packages on a Sunday are Amazon. Then if you can get to priority, other things, fine. But there, I think there's such a fear by the post office of losing that contract or that business that they just do whatever, whatever it takes and you know, workers suffer. But thank you. Appreciate it. I'm looking forward to getting the book. I think your comments too also just reminded me, you know, I think in somebody in the chat was talking about, you know, corporations externalizing their costs and, you know, all those, those deliveries are also taking a toll on roads, you know, and, and many of the residents and sort of, uh, areas where warehouses are concentrated are very concerned because there's all these potholes in the roads and things like that, you know, and it's, yeah, that wear and tear and the ways in which the government is sort of subsidizing this corporation, right? It's not just the private investors, but also the government as well. Totally. And then, you know, as far as free shipping, like you're talking about the real cost, it's not free. And I was an Amazon Prime member until I started working for the post office. And I'm like, okay, th this isn't free. It's, uh, you know, we're being exploited and overworked and uh, that's the cost. So anybody I know, I encourage to cancel their, their prime. But thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Carlos, you are the next person on stack. Um, hi, Ellen and Jake, and thank you for the book. It's, I, I think I read the conclusion last night. It looks fantastic. Um, and to Pluto also, and thank you, Michael Lardner, also for organizing the series. Um, I have too many questions, so I'll just do two quick ones. Uh, one is, I, it, this may have been at a previous MEP event earlier in the year, uh, maybe the Socialist Register one, I, I can't remember, it might have been some webinar I saw on YouTube. Um, but if you take the physical infrastructure of Amazon, um, say, say a plant, and you, you gave the you gave the the uh, what the drone or Google Earth image of um, is it Long Beach that you gave of that industrial area where you are? Um, is is that, uh, But my point is, it's is that's tantamount to a factory, is what I've heard. That this that what this is. Uh, I mean, Amazon is the leading company, not the only one, but the leading cor corporation, let me rephrase that, as that um, has, re has brought back industrial labor force to the United States. This is the form that industrial jobs are coming back in, I mean, overwhelmingly. Um, and of course, it's central to the, to the war state 
and the Empire as well. Um, is that analogy apt? My, my second question really quickly, and this is from a, a specific author, um, the Canadian journalist Corey Morningstar, whose book is from 2019, is called The Manufacturing of Greta Thunberg, and that's a whole other. Um, it leads up to the, the issue of both the Fourth Industrial Revolution and the Great Reset. And the point she made on, uh, I think it's Whitney Webb's podcast several months ago, um, is that among the, the host of other uh, apocalyptic processes that this is leading to is that the, uh, Am and Amazon being one of many sources, that the data centers and both the combination of the physical um, destruction of the whole global biosphere uh, from extractivism and everything, but also that the, the, the amount of energy that they're going to need globally, and this is what happening everywhere that they're being built, um, it's just going to burn up the planet. And it makes the whole uh, World Economic Forum Great Reset and the, the, way, the, the Green New Deal itself as it's constructed, uh, it's a Trojan horse. Um, so I'm just wondering with the question of data centers, at least in that regard, is Amazon is one of the major global powers in this involved and as a defense company. Um, could you guys comment on one or both of those questions? Thank you so much. Well, that's a lot. Yeah, but it is, I mean, it's a huge multifaceted corporation, much like you're describing, right? It's all of that, right? And, and you know, so, and even, you know, thinking about the warehouse locations, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, I mean, it's blue collar, in, it's much like a factory, right? If you go into the warehouse, how mechanized they are, you know, the assembly line quality to the work, you know, the repetitiveness and, and the, the amount of uh, automation that's happening, right? There's, there's a lot of parallels, but, you know, and it's interesting too, just trying to um, like measure warehouse workers, right? It's, it gets very complicated, you know, like how, how you classify them <laughs> because it's like they're both like many of them are temp workers. So they're classified under the temp industry. Others are like uh, part of the warehouse, right, uh, industry. And then still others are sort of in the e-commerce retail sector, right? So, and, and I, you know, that's just thinking about the warehouse workers and the ways in which they sort of cross over multiple kinds of industries. Industries, right and and then as you're pointing out right where you have this sort of high-tech part of the corporation right and um, you know they're getting into you know, like making movies and other things like that distributing them and you know zoom zoom platforms and you know this retail platform this logistics company I mean it's huge it's enormous and growing right um, so it's very very complex but I think you're right that you know in many aspects right the the warehouses are it's, they're very similar to factories, right? In the ways they work, right? That high division of labor, you know, although there's often some cross training that's often happening, uh, but it's, you know, you, very routinized, very repetitive kinds of work, um, a lot of automation as well. So I think you're right to draw parallels there. I guess one, one, of, one of the big differences though from the traditional factories and, you know, um, is Amazon's, uh, kind of delivery uh, infrastructure and kind of algorithmic system um, has built in uh, numerous, uh, you know, uh, redundancies in the system, right? So if, if one um, fulfillment center is organized, um, well, that's not going to stop the, the Amazon Prime machine, right? Um, it, it, it is a unique and challenging, uh, you know, uh, behemoth of, of organizing. Um, and one other interesting kind of thing um, that, you know, we've learned along the way is the concentration of who is a prime member is, is I think, kind of interesting. Um, you know, we see that disproportionately middle-class folks are prime members uh, as opposed to 
you know, the working poor and working classes might be more likely to shop at, at Walmart or some other big box store like that. Um, so Amazon is uh, trying to entice um, uh, as many working people as possible, offering discounted Prime memberships to students and to veterans and to other groups. Um, but if you look at the affluence and, you know, Broadly speaking, folks making 150 million, 150,000 uh, a year annually, families, um, about 80% of those families are, are prime members and, and pur purchase the most amount of products. Um, one thing that, um, you know, speaking of the big factory, uh, one of the, the biggest warehouses in the world is being built right now in Otay Mesa, California, on the border um, of the US-Mexico border uh, on the US side. And Amazon is, I think what's next is really going to, uh, you know, expand their kind of binational um, ways of skirting uh, tariffs and uh, flying in a lot of products to Mexico and, and having those trucked in and, and then delivered to Southern California. So this is another uh, way that, um, you know, Amazon's finishing that. It's the biggest one in North America that they're building right now in OTMS, a, a pseudomines research unit, Spencer. And I, I wanted to add that, you know, the warehouses, it's not just a place where you store goods, but also some of, sometimes the final assembly parts of products it happens there. So there is a productive element to it as well. It's not just inventory and storage, right? But sometimes they're taking packages apart into smaller ones and getting them ready for consumers as well. Yeah. So related to some of this is a question G, I think it's a person named George, but I'm guessing has asked about whether Amazon is getting involved in the auto industry, perhaps in some way, uh, reducing the choke points there, the, 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 the distances between arrival at the various circuits that they need to do. So uh, go ahead. Jake or Ellen? Uh, you know, I, I just, I know some about this uh, that, you know, because I've been studying the last mile delivery. And of course, um, Amazon has been gobbling up these Ram, uh, whatever, 3,500, whatever these van delivery vans are and, and purchasing uh, these by, you know, big orders, you know, 30,000 at a time. Um, but what, what was striking to me was um, Amazon, uh, and this was kind of uh, under the, the news kind of uh, radar generally, but they made the largest um, electric car uh, purchase by a private company in history. Um, they purchased, you know, almost a billion dollars. It was like 700 plus million, but there's all these other expenses with that of this startup company. I think it's called Rivian. Uh, Rivian, yeah. Uh, this startup. Um, I imagine Amazon will probably acquire this this company that's building these e electric vans. Um, and I, I, I think they're, they're right now in the, in the empire, um, environmental justice organizations are really, they had a major win recently of about electrifying the warehouses uh, to get some immediate relief for, for the inundated communities and the toxicity in the region. Um, Amazon knows that's next. They're gonna have to be accountable and a lot of other logistics companies like FedEx and others uh, will be as well. Um, but I also think they're going to use this as their kind of greenwashing kind of campaign as well, right? Uh, that we see, if, I saw Amazon ads on TV and they talk about how their climate pledge and Jeff Bezos is $10 billion. You know, it's all uh, smoke and mirrors. So, um, Ellen, do you have anything to add or should we go to my stack? Are you, are you okay with that, Ellen? Yeah, I sure am. Okay. So uh, one of the aspects that I, you have both touched on quite a bit is the relationship of Amazon to the legacy of box stores, the Walmarts, the Targets, the Costcos, et cetera. And these companies are not going away. They are really all behemoths. And there are large capital uh, forces behind this besides the retail and the distribution of retail. When we look at other developments uh, on the side of capital, we see to get all, keep all this going, 
the cloud is being built out tremendously and they're discovering it's not cool enough in Montana. They need to start building out the cloud in the tundra. The, the, so the green blue thing that uh, Michael Dola was bringing up before is incredibly related to this because the, uh, the, the, all these Amazon driver monitors, all of this needs a lot of computing power that needs to be cooled down all the time. So we have the cloud build out. We have chips, the NVIDIA chip, I don't know, four years ago was doing three trillion calculations a, a second on the, uh, the, the autonomous vehicles. And, and the NVIDIA chip today is approaching seven trillion calculations per second. When we think of that kind of computing power, we know that capital is, is developing tremendously. Yet we as a class rarely look at all of these things, the cloud, those, these warehouses, those chips, those trucks, and everything they're delivering as stuff we as a class have made. Now, I don't know if we as are going to wake up, but Ellen, you spoke quite a bit on how this is becoming an international movement, both because people are waking up to this and of necessity. So are you seeing, I, I'm putting all this out there and maybe there's not much more to add to it, but are you seeing more ripples than that of the logistics drivers in Italy getting together? Has that spread to Switzerland, Greece, Egypt? Has it, or is that what you described in India, an example of the example of the Italian workers being emulated elsewhere? We also have, besides Amazon, the other behemoth on the planet is Alibaba, which is doing the same crap um, to different sectors of the globe. So in many ways, it's daunting. We see wages being pushed down to a, a universal wage. And at, but at the same time, the, the, our class position vis-a-vis -vis those who have all this stuff that they're building out and choking us to death with, are, we are, this is pointing some ways towards heightened class consciousness, which we hope is for ourselves and not uh, something that is demoralizing in the end. But uh, maybe you could speak a little bit to that uh, pile of stuff I just gave you. Yeah, yeah, well, I think it's important to, to not just focus on the union campaigns happening in the United States, but you know, for, for years now, there have been successful union unions right in europe and um that uh are amazon warehouse workers and there has been transnational alliances uh happening among those workers right even though the the unions are different and even in in um different particular countries there may be multiple unions that are organizing amazon warehouse workers but they are you know coordinating and particularly we see this around those big consumer holidays right the the prime day but also may day right uh this past may day um we we're seeing interesting alliances happening and transnational act action happening um and this is spreading as jake is mentioning right into into latin america as well right uh it's not just mexico but but further down in latin america um so yeah there are some interesting transnational alliances that that are forming and i think there's also you know it's not just amazon workers too that are building alliances but sometimes we see uh you know larger uh, alliances uh, across companies you know i think um you know in southern california for example you know the may day action there was um a strike and actually i think this was happening nationwide you know where it was target uh whole foods amazon and instacart right <laughs> the big retail companies and and the frontline workers right saying hey our health matters you know we're being endangered and which we haven't really talked that much about you know the the real health risks that that uh amazon warehouse workers delivery drivers and other retail employees have been facing during this pandemic right so they were really resisting and you know forming alliances i think also that you know there's this uh, Congress of Essential Workers, right, which is not just warehouse workers, right, but it's, you know, kind of drawing bigger connections that, you know, I think is get, 
getting to the class consciousness that, that's growing, you know, as, as we're facing greater and greater levels of inequality. Yeah, one, and one of the things to, to Michael's, um, you know, point about, you know, the data centers and um, some of you may have been following this, this dispute between Amazon and Microsoft and when Trump awarded this contract to Microsoft, this Pentagon contract of uh, 10 plus billion dollars to store this secret data, right? Um, this is just one example of the increasing kind of uh, state corporate nexus that um, Amazon and other uh, big data corporations um, are facilitating. Uh, folks mentioned in here, um, Google and, and uh, you know, Israeli state violence and, uh, you know, whether it's ICE uh, or, um, you know, ring doorbell system partnering with hundreds of local police departments. Um, we're, we're certainly seeing the interests of kind of the capitalist state and uh, these, these big corporations in the tech realm. Michael Dola has another stack question. Go ahead, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Um, I am um, just reminded of um, that trip that I took into Staten Island. There was a uh, group along with Mr. Smalls um, who were organizing with something called the Congress of Essential Workers. Um, I'm wondering if you guys could speak more about uh, this organization. It seems like on their Twitter, they only just started last summer. And um, yeah, I followed, I tried to follow them. There was a gentleman who spoke, uh, I think he was a former employee. And, um, and, and he said, you know, as a guy uh, on the North Shore of Staten Island who didn't have really much experience, but a, a record, a, a, you know, getting um, jammed up with the cops and as a former dealer, like he had no other options he felt at the time but to go for a relatively good salary at 15 an hour. But, um, you know, and he, in the course of him telling his story, I, I, I won't forget him describing like the, the shuffle at the end of the shift. He was just like in pain. He was in pain every night. And, um, and also found it compelling because he, he talks about the speed up, not just the speed up, but the combination of that and, the sort of the file that they build on you for every infraction, every little thing that goes into whatever, like your, you know, docket for them to use if they see fit at some future date. So I thought that was really gross. And um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that group and um, thanks in the chat. I, I got uh, Jake uh, the, um, the, the website. So I appreciate that. Just wanted to talk again. Thanks. Yeah, and my sense is that Congress of Essential Workers has been doing some protests um, at Bezos's mansions, right? <laughs> and sort of drawing, and, you know, attention to just the massive wealth, right, that this one individual has amassed from this corporation, you know, through, through sheer exploitation, right? Through through this hyper exploitative practices that that I think Michael has has uh, painted a good picture of, yeah, and I and I don't think that speaker was isolated, right? Many of the interviews um, that were collected by my re research team also spoke to just the pain and exhaustion at the end of the day, right? Of feet and your muscles aching, right? The repetitive motions and, and so forth is really taking a toll on the, on the body. And, you know, injury rates are very, very high. Um, and, you know, and then there's the sort of physical risk too of the pandemic itself, right? And working in these massive warehouses. And, you know, and there has been, a, you know, the company has done various things to, you know, make it safer, but it's certainly not safe, you know, and, and, you know, workers, you know, are reporting, you know, that, you know, not everybody has their mask on all the time, because often they get hot, you know, sometimes they're, they're moving things in and out of very hot, you know, uh, trucks, right, in hot areas, you know, you know, and going back and forth, you know, in, in and out of the warehouse and so forth, right, and, and it, it, especially if you're working inside of that truck, it's just, you know, grueling, and very hot, so it's hard to sort of keep that mask on at all times, you know, but yet there's a lot of pressure to make rate, right, and then that pressure often means that workers feel the pressure to, to, you know, put the, you know, get closer than they should, right, to another worker, right, to try to get the job done and so forth. So, you know, Carlos, you're putting a lot in chat and I, I, I try to read, but it's too hard to read to the side. 
Is there a question you would like to put up there, Carlos? Uh, uh, if not, just say. Yeah, just um, I, this this popped into my head in the course of uh, what Jake and Ellen were saying. Um, I'll, I'm just going to read what I wrote. Is is this new acceleration of the productivity rate, a making rate, as you both, both called it, as that's the term, um, for, for workers. Um, and I'm going to, let me broaden this to the whole, you said about 1.8 million. So let's say the whole 2 million, roughly, Amazon labor force uh, globally. And I'm sure it differs by country a bit. But, um, and basically, zero allowances for errors, mistakes, downtime. Could we call this sort of uh, regime, labor regime or regimes plural, uh, neo Taylorist, neo Fordist? Maybe define what those are, because I don't know. Maybe not everybody knows. Or are they too quanti qualitatively different? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another great question. Uh, appreciate you all with the you know sharing and, and uh, this engagement is just so great. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of. Uh, a, a really good uh, researcher activist uh, named Francesco Massimo. Uh, he was an Italian researcher. Uh, Francesco um, actually wrote a great chapter for the in the book as well. Um, specifically, is looking at kind of Taylorism as it applies uh, to to Amazon. Um, Francesco worked in uh, two where two fulfillment centers. Um, I believe one in France, one in uh, Italy. Um, and describes how the management process uh, very much draws on on kind of some of these, you know, an updated spin on these tail Taylorist uh, methods of kind of worker control and management practices. Um, and another thing that I think is, you know, um, an in interesting kind of component, uh, what a lot of work has been done on is is the gamification of work, um, in in kind of warehouse work uh, in in fulfillment center work. Um, where workers um, and Amazon is really driving this, the gamification. So making work like a video game, right? Because the mun, you know, mundane uh, kind of aspects of work and um, worker dissatisfaction uh, to also do these competitive games to kind of pit workers in one part of a warehouse against another part of a warehouse over these kind of productivity metrics and offering this like, Amazon swag and, and kind of coupons and gift cards. And, you know, these are the things that the corporation is really integrating um, because so many workers are complaining uh, of uh, the drudgery of the job. Um, uh, but I think um, ultimately uh, these, these efforts are, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, dark side of, of all this stuff. For sure. I will take a, a, another stack myself. So I've been unemployed because of various reasons since March of 20. And living in New Jersey, I am required to look for a job. And I get tons of job offers in my email every day, both in my spam and in all the th ways that Google segregates your email i get them in all the categories and every time i click and all the job offers are related to what i've done over the last 20 years of my life and virtually every click on is a job loading shelves or unloading shelves at amazon warehouses so when that happened i talked to friends in other states who are getting unemployment benefits the same thing is going on there. Some of the click-throughs, I can tell information about me has been provided, not, maybe not to Amazon, but to, whoever, to whatever other platform is working digitally with Amazon on finding low-cost labor, uh, such as I would be because of whatever. N Amazon, prior to the pandemic, was very loud proclaiming when they were trying to come into New York and even after that they were going to go beyond the minimum of 15, but this didn't happen. Then in fact, many of those who take these Amazon jobs get a few weeks of work, they either get hurt, can't stand it and quit, 
but the average pay is somewhere between 13 and $14 an hour. But I wonder in, in that how much state interconnection there is, how complete is the integration between the state, the federal state, the, the, the capitalist state, and the various states that you may have uncovered in some of your research. I do feel that with this type of thing going on in the background, there will be a lot of integration uh, that's taken place already that we're not aware of, and, and the state will come down fairly hard on a large scale organizing thing, but this is where we're heading in our class divide anyway. Then one other quick aside, but which is really an aside from this, a friend of mine figured out that you can go on to, if you're a prime member, you can go and get a high end photographic print for 15 cents and mail it for 15, for the same 15 cents. As a prime member, that's what you can do. And now she spends about $10 and sends out hundreds of beautiful photographs at less cost than putting that crap in her home printer. That's just putting that out there. But go ahead. Yeah, the, that's news to me about the complicity maybe with unemployment offices. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that. So thanks for sharing that. But yeah, it makes sense, right? That the, this data, right, that's being collected, right? And probably various contracts, right, that shift hands and, and, and whatnot. And I, and I think it, it, you know, also, you know, there has been this surge in Amazon employment, you know, in part because there aren't other jobs, right, around. And I know that's been happening, you know, just talking to my students, you know, my classes, you know, a lot of them, you know, that they used to work for the hotel industry or for the retail industry or, you know, working um, fast food and, and so forth. And a lot of places closed up, right, during the pandemic pandemic, you know, meanwhile, what's growing, right? Amazon, right? And so, you know, I think a lot of workers, you know, uh, have had, you know, little choice except to work for Amazon, right? And facing many of the very difficult conditions that, that we've been describing. Janice already commented on how many people she knows who are elderly, like I am, who have been compelled to go to work in Amazon. And now we have states that are pulling away the $300 a week supplement. And the, there is this political move to force people back to work at whatever job that is available, which I feel Amazon will take tremendous advantage of. I know they will, and they're, they're part of the, the setup on that. So, what has been the, the, after the failed organizing attempt in Alabama, what other organizations are, uh, you've mentioned some, but is there going to be a further organizing drive at this point? Is it going to be targeted at another Amazon location? Do you have, or is it going to get beyond this company and take on warehousing logistics in general? When uh, Dave, I was hoping David, the postal worker guy had stayed longer because I do know the Postal Service is being attacked tremendously and it, it, it was under extreme attack under the Trump years, but this is going to continue in another way. Um, it does seem to me when I pull in front of, in Manhattan, there are all these uh, post office box uh, fulfillment centers that are set up in neighborhoods for people to get mail at home because of problems getting it in their apartments. You know that where these places are when, you're, when you are trying to move around the city because they always have either a FedEx, UPS, or Amazon truck in front with 
a number of workers just gorging the trucks, trying to get them into the, 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 whatever those little postal centers are, taking up one or two lanes. It's, a, it's an urban scene that is everywhere in Manhattan these days. And, and it's sometimes at eight, nine o'clock at night when, when other people, I mean, the, it's just constant. It would seem to me that the FedEx, UPS, postal workers and Amazon workers, along with the Postmate and TaskRabbit people would start talking to one another, yet they're always under such complete pressure to keep moving and delivering, they don't have time to even have a sip of coffee together. Do you see any cross platform organizing, say of bike messengers with warehouse workers, with people fulfilling tasks for people at home. Do you see any cross-platform organizing going on? Well, I do think that there is a lot of organizing, you know, I don't know, you know, how much of it is like public, you know, but, you know, I suspect there may be other campaigns emerging. I know that the W, RWDSU union, you know, which is just one union, a claim that they got about a thousand workers, you know, reaching out to them saying they're interested in unionization. Right? <laughs> That's just one union, right? So I imagine that there is quite a bit of interest, you know, so I don't know. I guess we'll see what happens, you know, but I do think, um, you know, there has been some... Ellen, your mic has gone out. We can't hear. It's not working, Ellen. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe Ellen could come back. Yeah, it just cut out and it made, it made a noise and cut out. Um, but yeah, you know, so there's there there have been uh, a number of um, also I think really important uh, worker movements. Uh, you know, a group of a group of workers that aren't often typically typically discussed uh, that we we talk about and just mentioned in the book are these mechanical Turk workers. You know, these outsourced uh, contracted. Um, you know, workers that do a lot of, uh, you know, the tech support around the world uh, and these these real piece rate kind of jobs, um, they're organizing. Uh, they're, they're coming together and trying to get some sort of common uh, collective uh, gains. Uh, I mean, just, just really uh, unfair working conditions. Um, and of course, Amazon and other corporations, the gig corporations um, are, you know, not only violating in many ways, um, you know, uh, kind of federal labor standards, um, but also, you know, you know, like in California, um, we had a proposition that was basically written by Uber, right? To uh, you, you have now corporations rewriting laws, and this isn't necessarily new, uh, but the scale uh, that we're seeing and the impact on regular people's lives is is immense and immediate. Um, and so um, I, th I think it's promising to see some of the folks who are working on sectoral bargaining. I think I was mentioned earlier uh, in the chat um, of bringing up industries, whether it's the logistics industry, the gig economy, the gig workers, delivery workers, warehouse workers, grocery workers, um, you know, care workers, right? Caretaking workers who are disproportionately uh, women of color, immigrant workers. Um, and we've seen during the pandemic, uh, a surge of, of worker resistance, whether it's nurses, um, whether it's grocery workers, um, but um, you know, uh, to date, you know, nothing that is yet that is out and, and massive yet. But um, I know Ellen is in touch with folks who are working on things, and I'm as well in Los Angeles. And uh, some encouraging things are, I think, currently being worked on. Um. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep, no, we okay. can. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, Rupert has a, uh, or actually Janice, sorry, Janice had a question about um, the RSDSU appeal, right, of the failed Amazon um, vote, right, the unionization um, vote. Yeah, because there was uh, various labor law violations, right, that, and so they filed, right, uh, these, uh, uh, with the NLRB. So I think we're still waiting, right, for determination on that, but it's something to also pay attention to. 
Uh, they, they don't move quickly, those uh, NLRB cases. Yeah. Very, I mean, maybe <laughs> so five years while. from now, you might hear something. Right, yeah. Right. yeah. One, one, one uh, uh, I think Victory, um, Amazonians United Chicagoland won um, a NLRB complaint against Amazon um, that was filed by workers during the pandemic. Um, these workers are, you know, an amazing group of organizers who wrote a chapter for the book um, of, you know, kind of collectively um, about how this union of workers um, came together. And um, they staged a number of uh, safety strikes last year during the pandemic um, and faced retaliation by management in Chicago. Um, and so they filed this claim and they won. And so they're currently settling. I don't, I'm not sure what their current status is, but I think in March of this year, the, it was announced that uh, the NLRB found in the favor of Amazon's United Chicago land. So um, the other thing that happened to these workers is that Amazon shut down that delivery facility, uh, DCH, DCH1, and moved all the workers into this, what's called a mega cycle shift. You know, it was, it was uh, starts at like 1 a.m. to 11 a.m to 11 a.m. Uh, straight and uh, a really brutal shift that is anti-family and uh, especially for uh, mothers uh, who are trying to homeschool their children. So they've been organizing uh, really effectively around that as well. So uh, Jake, you had mentioned Amazon with all of its growing holdings, such as besides Whole Foods, the Washington Post and increasing holdings along with all the buildings Bezos is buying. There, there must be the one place he bought in the 30s is one of the old mansions of a robber baron, which makes sense that he would want that as a token. But there must be quite a staff there. I mean, if you, if you look at all, are the wall, Whole Foods workers counted in the 2 million plus Amazon workers or are those workers at all the, like the, the subcontracted workers? There could be another 30 or 40% additional workers. Right, yeah. No, and there's other companies too, like Zappos Shoes, right, that they took over, right? And so you think it's another company, right? But it's really Amazon, right? So, yeah, it's a and good the question. Film crews and the, the, the yeah. you know, the, uh, uh, the, all the television series Amazon is doing, uh, 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 there's a tremendous crews in, involved with that. Um, the, uh, I, 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 the, the audience going away is not because they are bored with the talk. Almost everyone who has left, except for the people I didn't know, told me they could come for a solid hour or an hour and a half, but they had other things they had to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. So, it's been great. Yeah. So I they feel like the jobs that the can, best for everyone. And the UK people, who there were three of them here, said they really couldn't stay awake. It was pretty late. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it's been a great discussion. Thanks so much for organizing this. And it's wait, wait, wait. Uh, Victor has another question. Uh, is why was Bessemer in an anti union state? Um, where this union fight took place? Why did the workers there decide to hold? Go, uh, maybe you know more about that than most of us do. So I don't know. It's a it's a very good question. I don't know uh, the story there, you know. But you know, I think it is sort of remarkable, right, that it did crop up there, um, you know. But you know, black workers do have the highest unionization rates, and most of the the workers in Bessemer, Alabama were black, you know, so I, you know, maybe that had something to do with it. I know there's also been a big movement to organize the South, you know, and, and so, you know, maybe it was strategically chosen, right, for that reason, like, you know, it is such an anti-union place, right, so let's go to the heart of it, right, let's go, to, you know, beat them, you know, where, where it's the hardest, you know, but it also maybe, you know, shows just the tremendous challenges that, that workers face in organizing in this country, you know, with the very weak, you know, collective bargaining rights that workers have, you know, that, you know, employers just kind of face these small penalties. And as we were talking, you know, it ta often takes years, right, even to enforce those, right. So, you know, it really sort of shows the, the need, right, for, for more uh, stronger rights for workers, right, to organize. Yes. 
I would just add, uh, you know, Robin Kelly's uh, excellent work um, on the South, uh, Hammer and Ho, and, um, you know, Professor Kelly was really, um, you know, uh, he gave some some great talks on, you know, Democracy Now! and stuff about Bessemer. Highly recommend, um, you know, checking those out as well. Really looking at the history of white supremacy uh, and anti-worker, uh, you know, laws in the South and organizing and Black resistance. Um, all the way up to Bessemer. Um, and uh, shout out to Dr. Kelly, uh, Cal State Long Beach alum. All right. Um, well, Janice is saying, all the more reason. Um, I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but Janice is making some good points. Would you like to speak to that, Janice, or is what you put in chat sufficient? Here, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, basically that's it. Um, I follow it a little bit with, you know, emails that I get from APW Union, uh, from Dick So, um, yeah, no U.S. president now dismissed. That's what the board does, the postal board. I don't think that's the official name. It's probably called the USPS board or something like that. Um, I believe it has five members and Biden just appointed two Democrats. It's uh, nominally nonpartisan, but of course it is partisan because Trump stacked it. Uh, Republicans. So, the AFL CIO uh, activist groups are pressuring that the two Democratic uh, appointed members to um, sway the vote, hold a vote, uh, somehow get DeJoy dismissed, get the board to dismiss DeJoy. So, people need to support those efforts. And APW has a uh, has a website. I think it's apwu.org, if I'm not mistaken. And Mark Dimenstein is pretty left for uh, an American Union official. Thank you, Janice. Sure. Uh, is there anyone with a question that they, because not, uh, every question is important. And I know Michael is sensitive to asking too many. If you noticed, I'm not sensitive to that. If people aren't asking, I'll keep. But any further questions? <clears throat> um, just yeah. quickly, I know I, I know the, the speakers have been on this for a long time, but uh, just uh, uh, something I'm curious about: um, Has there been any evidence of um, uh, sabotage on the line or out in the field? Whether um, I guess it's hard to to sort of calibrate or calculate or whatever. Like if people are slowing down purposely, um, I guess that's what the whole um, time management thing is meant to, um, uh, you know, prevent. But it, is there any sense that workers are participating in what I guess has been called infra politics, um, just their own sort of resistance in little informal ways. Thanks. And thanks again. And, and, and I appreciate uh, everybody's generous time. Thanks so much, Michael. Thanks, Janice and uh, Karen and Michael um, and the Michael who left and Carlos. I uh, appreciate you all very much. Um, you know, it, what, what strikes me, um, you know, to your question, um, I, I, a couple of years ago, I was actually on a, a panel with some Amazon workers um, in Paris, uh, where it was a choke points, this other book I did event. And it was, uh, there were two Amazon workers and um, really radical uh, workers. And um, you know, I was embarrassed. They were translating the event just for me to understand you know, what was going on. It was so insightful, but they were talking about you know, uh, kind of resistance in, in, in the workplace. Um, and uh, these two Amazon workers, one of, the, one of them had an, a really interesting idea that uh, I kind of um, uh, learned, you know, some some important lessons there. And they were talking about, um, you know, they they had a couple of works shut slowdowns and things. And um, is that one possible strategy uh, where consumers and workers could come together on would be 
uh, you know, there's the idea of uh, a boycott, um, but what would really gum up in, in they were talking about their fulfillment center is if is when a uh, if, if thousands of prime members and they're talking about in Paris loaded up their cart, uh, their shopping cart and purchased a bunch of things. And then, you know, short time afterwards, um, uh, deleted their, you know, basically refunded with their purchase. It, you know, if this was coordinated around the world uh, over a longer period of time, there would be a, a, a way to really strike back at what they were talking the bosses. Um, you know, just little actions like that are, are things that some of the workers and, and some of the community members, um, you know, are trying to think through. But of course, Amazon's algorithm and, you know, uh, supply chain management system is as complex as anything we've ever seen. Um, but there's interesting ideas like that floating around. These come from the workers themselves who know the system the best. You know, and I do also think there's, you know, sometimes small everyday acts of resistance to the individual workers engage in. I know, um, you know, some of the interviews we collected in um, the Inland Empire, you know, workers were describing, you know, getting up on those big lifts and they could get sort of above the camera view. <laughs> and then they said they could actually like interact and hang out and like talk to each other, you know? So, you know, those are like small ways, you know, that workers are kind of finding some humanity in it, you know, or, you know, sometimes workers would badge in other workers sometimes, you know, sometimes like students would, would, if they're, you know, in finals period or midterm season or something, you know, like would get somebody, a friend to badge them in and some, somehow they got through. I don't know quite, you know, how this happened, but, you know, so there's sometimes ways that they can kind of, you know, get around the system and surveillance, um, you know, in small ways. And also sometimes just on the job, you know, helping each other out, you know, sometimes, you know, there, sometimes there's a lot of competition over, you know, getting the better box that has more you know, products, you know, for the amount of space, but sometimes there was workers that would help each other out, right, the more collaborative efforts, and even, you know, as, as workers were mentioning, you know, this pressure to get the job done, they're often sometimes helping each other out, you know, in some like, those small ways of, of forming solidarity, you know, and sometimes it's also like, you know, forming that solidarity, not just at the workplace, but beyond it, right, and, and you know, you know, breaking bread together, having meals together, hanging out, right? That, you know, those, those, those kinds of uh, ways in which, right, that workers gain solidarity, uh, trust each other and, and begin to work together, you know, I think is so incredibly important, you know, for the larger actions. My final comment is going to be, besides thanking both of you, not just for coming, but for doing the book is, that uh, this has been a great kickoff to the Wildcat series uh, that is coming up. And we have uh, Manny Ness, who was one of the series editors, coming a week from Saturday on the 22nd to talk about his book, Organizing Insurgency, which is what the two of you are talking about in a way, <laughs> indirectly, but directly in a way. Um, and, and the series has a lot. There's a, a, a Robert Ovitz has the Workers' Inquiry book, which has a lot of what we at our various jobs can be doing and how to get that information out there to people. And both of you are invited to any of these talks that you want to come to. I must say, the whole, all the book jackets are very well designed. On that alone, the book jacket is almost frameable of your book. It is really a great book jacket. And, and the, the promotion for the whole series has been easy because Pluto got very good designers to work on the Wildcat series. It, it's, uh, it should it's win. A great press. Yeah, yeah they're, they're really incredible book jackets. Um, um, quick shout out to I, Melanie Patrick, Michael, who designed the book covers for Pluto. She works for Pluto. Uh, everyone, and I, I just have to plug Pluto because everyone we've worked with um, and who have interacted with has been so kind and supportive and as authors and scholars and researchers who are doing this kind of work, um, it's just it's just so great to, to have a, a radical independent press like Pluto. Um, yeah, and so thank great. you for, for really spotlighting great. that. Yeah, and, and they, they seem to welcome a broad spectrum 
perspective from the left and not narrow into one or this or that type of uh, orientation, which, uh, and they, they incorporate all the orientations in doing so, which is really pretty remarkable and have been very supportive of the MEP and, and uh, put me in touch with both of you, uh, along with Manny. But thanks everyone who came tonight. We hope, yes, kudos to Ellen and Jake. Great work. <laughs>